and maybe it does. <clears throat> uh, don't those experiences, though, have a sort of progressive uh, quality so that it's, you know, the, the people who, um, I don't know if it's been, if it's been uh, measured in, in the hospital room during clinical death, how long they've been gone, for instance, but they, there's some that say they've gone all the way to the white light, for instance, where it was just nothing but white light versus those that were in, you know, I saw my body still, I was aware, aware of the room and things. I mean, you think that there's a slow dissolution into, because people have said they've gone into white, white light, for mm -hmm. instance, yeah. and then they come back. What's in the white light state where there's nothing? There's no objects, there's no computation, there's, there's nothing there, but, and yet they're aware of it. And they say it's like extraordinarily euphoric and right. incredible. A sense of <clears throat> calm, a sense of uh, that everything is okay, and they're not frightened. And uh, which, and when people try to explain this by delusions due to lack of oxygen, it, 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 that doesn't jive because when patients are short of oxygen, they get confused, confused and agitated. And these patients have just the opposite reaction. They're very serene and calm. And when they come back, they they say it was actually it, it wasn't uh, scary at all. It was it, most of the time, not all the time, that it was very uh, calm. And Right. I mean, there's right, no... but I mean, if patients get hypoxic, that is, suffer lack of oxygen, okay. before the, you know, while they're still there, they're confused and agitated. Okay. So there's some people who try to explain these near-death experiences by saying, well, lack of oxygen causes this hallucination of sense of calmness, but that doesn't really uh, fit. B besides which, they describe things that occur when they are gone, and in some cases, uh, uh, things that they couldn't have, have known otherwise. In some cases, things that occur out in the waiting room. So there's a lot of very, at least anecdotal, bizarre things that can't be explained by conventional explanations. And I think, you know, there's a reasonable possibility that it's, that, that consciousness being a process in fundamental space-time geometry, I know I keep saying that like a broken record, but, but that's the universe. That's, that's where we live. That's all there is, really. And the consciousness is a self-organizing process at that level, and it goes out to the universe at large, but yet hangs together somehow because of this quantum entanglement. So it gives the possibility that there is a soul or a spirit after death. Um, <clears throat> although that's where we live, <clears throat> we actually, I mean, wouldn't it behoove us to go, wouldn't, wouldn't we prefer in a way to go to, um, so we, were, we became nothing but a field of, of microtubules or quantum, compu uh, quantum computers versus having, you know, mass and things that we have to worry about feeding and clothing and, and housing and things, I mean, and, and moving about in this very, I mean, a very frictionful, <laughs> um, you know, level here. I mean, yeah, well, could, why, why would we, if it's all... <clears throat> well, maybe that's what happen, happens to us. That's where we go when When, when, when we that die. occurs. So and all it, that's left then is, is the quantum computers and then... Quantum information. Yeah, yeah. Quantum. In fact, you know, the Kabbalah is another approach to this. And the Kabbalah, uh, Jewish mysticism, if you will, says that we live in a world of one, the 1% 1 world of... of uh, aggravation basically things are kind of uh, rough frictionful as you said and on the other side and then there's a curtain on the other side there's wisdom and light and mm -hmm. enlightenment and there's a curtain in between and, and consciousness occurs actually dances on the edge between the one percent world of aggravation I call it and the 99 percent world of wisdom and light you might say well if the quantum world the quantum world is very small yeah, how can it be the 99% world? If you go down in scale, you're getting smaller, but the amount of information is vast. If you go down to these quantum gravity level of spin networks, for example, to the actual pixels of consciousness, or pixels of the universe, uh, there's something like 10 to the 107th in, our, in the volume of our brain. So the amount of information is, is so vast, it's just mind-boggling. So the 99% world could indeed be this small quantum world, but it's everywhere, so it's really, really vast. And maybe that's where we go, you know. Do you think then that um, we always experience, uh, I mean, okay, say that's where we go, is it also assumed that that's How did we come here in the first place? <laughs> to get to the other side. Wait, but didn't we come from yeah, maybe. behind the curtain? It, it could we be. We stepped out on stage? It and could then be. I mean, if you believe in uh, reincarnation and so forth, that's quite possible that those things happen. I mean, why do, these... okay, then, then why do we ever step through the curtain to this 1%? I mean, it seems so limiting. Why would we come here? Were I don't we, know, it's were kind we, of fun. Were we pushed here? Or? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, why not? I mean, but it, it could be, I think biology actually uh, evolved and developed to house and access consciousness and to, to take
you know, sort of distributed non-local uh, form into concentrated form for a while, and then we go back there and. and but why? I mean, what's what? Would, what would be the motive, or I mean, is that just a natural occurrence? That's just the nature of the universe. Could be, you know. Uh, Paula Zizi is a an astrophysicist in Italy, and she she has this theory. Uh, right after the Big Bang, the universe underwent this very very rapid inflation, uh, like in a, in a tiny fraction of a second. It just expanded very, very fast, and then it reached its threshold, and then, since then, it's been expanding very, very slowly. This is called period of inflation. And she, she has theorized that this end of that the inflation stopped and the uh, expansion has been very, very slow, was that, this, that before that, everything was in superposition. There were multiple universes, tiny universes, but expanding very rapidly. And at that moment, uh, the Penrose objective reduction was met, and the multiple worlds collapsed to one. And since then, it's been expanding fairly slowly. They now, collapsed, meaning they basically dissolved. No, no, no. It reduced from multiple possibilities to one. One universe was chosen. Okay. And by Penrose's definition, that is a conscious moment. So she says that at that moment, shortly after the Big Bang, the universe had a conscious experience. She Wouldn't it still be conscious then? Maybe. Or, it, uh, or at least proto-conscious, because... I think that at this fundamental level, at least anything in superposition has the potential to be conscious. It may not have a lot of information, so it may not be conscious in the sense that, that, that we're conscious, but potentially at least there could be some kind of pure consciousness with or without information. She called it, by the way, her, her theory is called uh, the Big Wow, because at this moment the universe had this cosmic conscious experience right after the Big Bang. Um, they say that the universe is going is basically, as it, ex as it expands, if it can, keeps going at its current speed, trajectory, whatever, it's going to essentially, um, we're looking at a big ocean of radiation about, a, you know, I don't know how many billion years from now, 100 billion or whatever. Um, they say it's sort of like the way the ocean eventually breaks down anything that's like, you know, lost ships or whatever, mm -hmm. that, that eventually it, it dissolves it. it Entropy, and yeah. and, and yeah. that means it'll dissolve our, pl our, our galaxy and solar system and, and, and us, right, into nothing but radiation. What happens? Then. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, who knows? Nobody, nobody knows for sure. But, but the other thing about this is that, uh, you know, this funny thing about time going backwards. So, you know, we can always maybe go backwards in time. Who knows? Hmm. Great. Well, <laughs> it's a lot to ponder. Thank yes, you very is. much. You're welcome, Greg. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot.